Well, welcome with me today, Joan Smith, on this beautiful Father's Day. Hi. Well, I'm going to teach today on something that is may or may not apply to you because a lot of us, um, I have 20 year old children, but a lot of you guys out there have grandchildren. But it's still applicable because we a lot of times have expectations of our grandchildren that can be as severe as those of our own children. But um, I'm starting out in Ecclesiastes and Solomon, who was one of the wisest men in the world. In Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse four is where I'm starting. He, um, he was talking about uh, people looking around at each other and I know for me um, it started in high school I gosh look to the left look to the right and you're you're living in the land of Ur <laughs> like you, everybody is smarter and there's they're prettier and they're richer and they've got nicer cars or, and they're sportier they're better in sports and think, you're just in the land of Ur. And it's it's not a fun place to be. It's junior, I guess, starts around junior high. Um, I called it junior high. <laughs> that dates me pretty well. Um, but Solomon says in chapter four, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed. I'm in 4-4, four, four, excuse me. And I saw that all toil and all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So what's a chasing after the wind? It's endless. It's meaningless. It's, there's no end point. There's no um, uh, end of the race. It's a it's a nice word picture, a nice analogy that describes what it means to live in comparison land. And it doesn't stop in high school. A lot of us, especially a lot of women, and there's about 12 women here. We spend a lot of time looking around at other women's clothes. We look to the left, to the right. Boy, if I had that house. Boy, if my husband did that. Boy, if I was smarter. Boy, if I was on and on, better in every possible way. Well, you know, it's really funny. I don't think I ever spent any time comparing myself to a man, you know? <laughs> but lots of other women. But so then you grow up and you're doing the same thing to your kids. You're, you're trying to get their, your kids to be uh, better than your brother-in-law's kids your neighbor's kids, your associates at school's kids. And it, you put a lot of pressure on them. It takes a lot of joy out of your relationship, hurts your relationship. Hurt, you compare your husband to other husbands. Oh, he's not, my husband is not nearly as good to me. He's, he's his, that husband, he's better. He's Ur, he's in the land of Ur. So wh what does Solomon say about all this? He, he says, um, again, that it's meaningless. All this toil, all this envy, envy is the big word here. It, it ruins our relationships. It has no good end. But then he goes on to chapter five, and he's, he's not proposing apathy either. Um, he's, as you can read, um, fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. So he's not saying just lay back and be apathetic. Don't have any goals. Don't have any expectations for your life or for your kids or expect them to um, have higher standards. He's not saying that. But is, is there a third option? Is there a third option? Well, rather than being a fool or living in the land of Earth, um, the third option, he, um, 
he actually gives an example here if you read on, but I'm not going to read on about a man who was all alone and he was not content. He was not content with his wealth. And well, he says, for whom am I toiling? He asked, why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. <laughs> well, yeah, it can be meaningless. So, so what's the third option? Um, well, he gives us a really nice mind picture in Ecclesiastes 4, 6. And he says, better is one handful with tranquility. Tranquility. What is tranquility? Look it up in the dictionary. It's, it's peace. Pardon. <laughs> I got to put on my readers. It's satisfaction, contentment, and peace. Well, that's a good way to live. But how often do you see people who do that? Can you imagine if all the Christians, the people who call themselves Christians, if they actually live that way? Can you imagine what, how our country would be, how our neighborhoods would be, how our relationships would be? If people were just satisfied, if they were just tranquil, if they were just peaceful, we'd all be like Deepak Chopra or, or Jeff, Jeff Wenley. <laughs> and Jeff, you can say it. Say, say the Elvis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Say it. Oh, he can't say it. Anyway, oh, he's, <laughs> he's muted. He's muted. Oh, wait, there he's going to unmute it. You're, you're muted. <laughs> Never mind. Going? He can't. There he goes. He's got I'm it. on now. What am I supposed to say? Thank you. Thank you very much. The Elvis. Thank you, Elvis. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs> yeah, like they're uh, a terrific example of a couple who uh, they're real tranquil, full, and peaceful and happy with each other. And one could be jealous of them, one could compare themselves with them. But the word instructs us not to do that. It's not productive. It's a waste of time. You know, maybe. Okay, so anyway, we're going back to uh, verse six. Better one hand with tranquility than two handfuls with toil. So what does that mean? Um, if you look it up, the two handfuls with toil is, it's, it's stress. It's you're holding on tight. You're, you just, oh, your life is full of aggravation and irritation. And you're trying so hard to attain something that is not in your wheelhouse. It is not uh, something that God's given you the talent for or something that God has not uh, equipped you for. Instead of being thankful for what you do have, you are like, jealous of your co-worker who just got a great promotion that you were hoping to get and got passed over for and is it's stress it's so better with the open hand with tranquility so i want you, i want everybody out here in in uh, audience land i want you to put your hands up like this and um this is the one hand open, and this is one hand that's closed. Now I want you to take both hands and close them. So that's discontentment, stress, living in the land of Ur, comparing yourself to other people. And then you turn one hand over, get rid of that hand. This is open hand, letting God, waiting God to receive from God. You're peaceful, you're thankful. You're willing to live with whatever God's ready to give you. So that's, uh, thanks for the audience participation. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so that represents God's opportunity to place things in your hand, in your life. Um, to peace, contentment, tranquility. And so... Um, The next time you begin daydreaming about um, 
how much better your husband, your wife, your car, your house, your situation could be. Think about what God has given you. Physically clench your hands and thank God for what you do have. And then see what he can bring you to satisfy your situation. Um, so that's your option for envy and toil. Um, great. The, uh, there's an example in, you remember the example of the men with the talents, the three talents, the master gave the three talents, bags of gold. Well, those guys, that the first guy with the one bag of gold who he buried he buried his bag of gold. And then when his master called him on it when he came back from the trip, what did he do? He blamed the master. He said, I know you're a hard man and you're you're difficult to deal with. And that's why I buried it. And what did he do? He, he, it says, the word says that he cast him out into the darkness with um, tears and um, clenching, uh, like grunt, teeth clenching. That doesn't mean he sent him to hell. It means he, he was frustrated. He was like, dang, dang, dang. He gritted his teeth and he, he realized what a dope he was <laughs> for not doing nothing in the situation for doing nothing with what God had given him because he was afraid so the takeaway there is uh, don't look in the mirror let God be your mirror in uh, Philippians I'm going to go there real quick this is a scripture you're all familiar with Philippians 4 8. So, what are we supposed to think about? We've all heard this, we've all read this, but the answer to living in the land of Ur, and by the way, there is no win in comparison. That's a, that's a great way to remember this. There's no win in comparison. So, your mirror is, is God your Father, and that's the life we want to be living. So, we want to, how do we do that? We go to Philippians 4 8, perfect example. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Don't think about what your neighbor has. Don't think about how good looking your girlfriend's husband is. Just be thankful for, for when you're tempted to look to the right. And look to the left and compare yourself. Forget about that. Com compare yourself to what God's going to be talking to you about at the Bema. Because he's not going to be asking you about somebody else. He's not going to be comparing you with somebody else. He's going to be comparing you with you. And what did you do with all the things that he gave you? Did you do nothing like the parable tells us? Or did you maximize all the gifts that God has given you and what you have to work with? Maybe you had a rotten start. Maybe you had terrible parents. Maybe you were abused. Maybe you had a horrible life. That doesn't mean you can't start from today and move on, move ahead. Let God put something in your hand. And live in peace and tranquility. Father, thanks for um, letting us spend a moment with you. Let us be thankful this day for all that we have and all that you've given us. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, thank awesome. you, John. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And next, we have John Ponyo with us on this Father's Day. Hope you're enjoying the day.
Happy Father's to all you Father's Day. Awesome. All right. Time. Hello, everybody. I was thinking how hard it is to prepare a teaching um, in a small time frame to get a, a message or a point across that we can take, we can each take something with us for the day or for the moments before we move on to the other things that bombard our minds. <laughs> but uh, the idea is, is we, we have to be, we have to read the Bible and we should be reading it from cover to cover to get the big scope of the word to try to understand where, where we fit in the big picture of things. And, and, and it, you know, why am I here? Kind of Jeff brought that up in his teaching. And I thought about the promises of God. Where do we find the promises of God? They're written in the word. Mm -hmm. And if we want those promises, it says it had in Peter there that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness written in the pages of scripture. Well, we all go through similar things in life at different times. And some things tempt us more than others to not trust God but we all go through them, but somewhere in those pages is an answer for us to find success in life. And um, so today being Father's Day, my dad just turned 95 yesterday. Wow. And uh, you know we're all, many of us are at an age where our parents are gone or have been gone for long periods of time, some more than others. And and uh, fortunate I, I am that my dad is still with me and in one sense, because I'm not the dad. <laughs> I'm not the patriarch of the family yet. There's still somebody above me. It's like I have someone still to look to. Like if I really need something, I have a dad that I can still go to. Mm -hmm. And I, and so I thought about what is the greatest gift that a dad could get on Father's Day? Mm -hmm. And I think it's forgiveness. You know, we, when we're children, our, if we're fortunate enough to have parents at, in our home. Um, they're our God <laughs> when we're young children. They provide everything. They provide the stage for living. They tell us right from wrong. They, they shape us and mold us before we even understand anything about life. They tell us how to reason, what's right, what's wrong. And if, if for us, it, well, for all people, God wanted us to have the standard of the word of God living in our own hearts and lives so that we, we, we're, we live it so that our children can live it. It, it, it. It's just passed on from generation to generation by how we live or our manner of conversation in life. It's not necessarily teaching them how to remember Bible verses and clap, their, clap our hands when they say it right. But it's that that word gets down in their hearts. So when they get involved in life, that's what comes to their mind. At least it's one of the thoughts that can come to their mind when they're dealing with the, the issues of life so that they'll make good, wise decisions so that their life will be blessed. So they'll use the talents like Joan talked about that they won't hide or run because they're afraid, that they'll have self-confidence or confidence in their ability to hear God's voice, to make good choices. Mm. And I think to compare ourselves with others is not wise, but to compare ourselves to how we live the word or how the, the word is living in us is, is good to do. Our, we check ourselves to see are our words and actions things that bless God are, are we living and so without the Bible in front of us every day we tend to get distracted from what's true and good to think on those things we can think about other things I was thinking of when Rita was talking about the fire up in Flagstaff my sister sent me pictures of it it was kind of right outside my niece's uh, backyard there in the mountains, but uh, kind of frightening. 
But in James, it talks about our tongue being like a fire and that it can cause a lot of problems in life. And, and so there's a cause and effect, right? We, many times in life, when we have troubles, we're always looking at the effect. We're looking at what happened, not why it happened. And if we, if we don't try to understand why things happen the way they happen and look to that, we're, we're going to continue going down the same path because we're just looking at the effect. And it's like, why does this keep happening to me? Why does this keep happening to me? Because you're looking at the effect. You're being ruled by your emotions or your response to the things that happen instead of looking at the why did it happen? What caused what's happening in my life? And, and a lot of life just happens. Like someday you wake up and find yourself miserable. Or someday you wake up and find yourself happy and blessed. And God, that's one of God's promises that when we obey him over a continued period of time, that we'll be blessed. Like we should just live blessed. We wake up in the morning happy about the day ahead because the word is is it says it's quick and alive or living and powerful and it, it gives life to us and as we saturate our minds with the word we become full of god's life and then um in the manifestations we we're told that we're god's hands and feet and his ambassadors that we represent him to the world and we do that by saturating our minds with the word and thinking on those things so that that's who we are we are what the word says we are because that's what we think and when it comes to parenting our children that's what we want to put in them most like we want to teach them how to think like we don't want to teach them necessarily what to think but how to think how to control their thoughts so that they can make their own wise choices so I'll go to um, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, and read. The, it says the Proverbs of Solomon. And it says, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is heaviness of his mother. I think a wise son makes a glad father. And I wonder about what my dad thinks of me today. You know, do I make him a glad father? And even if we don't have a father, we can think about, would the way that I'm living today be pleasing to my father? My, my, would, it, would it bless him? And so I think about even if we have never forgiven our fathers when they were alive for the things, the shortcomings in their life or the things that we felt they should have provided that didn't or the way they acted and didn't. When we forgive them, we, we can be made, they can be made whole to us. Like they can become a different person in our hearts because they're still alive in our hearts. They don't just go away. They, they are part of who we are and we can keep them in a little prison somewhere in the corner of our mind because of any hurt or thing they did to us. Or we can let them out and we can release their debt and forgive them and then we can take the good with the good because they weren't all bad they were there's a lot of good and a lot of we can start looking at the good and start holding fast to the good and thinking on those things so that our dads are we we take the good from them that they taught us and try to bring that and give that to our children the the, the good that they had to offer and it, it makes us whole. It gives us life. When we respect our fathers, we give honor unto them. And uh, fortunately, I'm privileged in my life at this point in time that, that I have three of the most awesome children in the world. Um, because they heeded their parents' instruction. And, and you know, it, it's like I didn't do that with my dad. <laughs> it, I... I made his life rough in a sense because I was a rebellious prodigal type child, but my children were not those types of children. They, they, they had enough love in their home to obey. Like there was no reason for them to want to go outside of that because 
they were loved. And, and it, it happened because both their mom and I loved God and we tried to do what God said to do as a parent. And um, so in Psalm 127, I just have a couple more scriptures. Um, it says in 119, I keep going. It's, it's interesting. Some of the Psalms like 119 are pages and pages long. And then there's some Psalms that there's like five on a page. So in Psalm 127, it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes in vain. I, I think about that. Like we, we, we build our lives on something. It goes day by day. We, we wake up because the world keeps spinning and we don't really have a choice. We sleep and we wake. But we build our lives on something. And then when we sort of do what Joan said about leave our hand open to receive from God so that we can build our house and allow the Lord to build it, it's just vanity. It, it is chasing the wind. It's nothing that will, will last. And it goes on to read in verse 3, it says, The children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of our youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The idea, one of the ideas behind God, children or the generations of people is for God to continue his word in the world. Like when we teach our children the word, when we're when we die and we're gone, the word will still live. And, and so when we have a quiver full of children that have the word, they won't be ashamed. Like they won't fall down when the pressure, the gate is the power of the city, right? You can't come in or out of the cities without getting through the gate. When, when we teach our children the word, they will have the strength to deal with the powers of the world. And so um, we just have to build our house on the Lord. Um, so I won't turn here, but Matthew 7, 24 through 29 is about building our house. Jesus said about building our house on the sand or on the rock. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, both of those houses can look the same. Like you were talking about, Joan, comparing ourselves to our neighbor's house or whatever, their cars or whatever. From the natural eyes, both of those homes look the same. You know, but what is the foundation holding that up? Because when the storms of life try us, it will be found to either stand strong or, or fail in and crash. And I think that a dad sets the stage for his home. It, it's, it, it's, um, you know, when dad comes in the door at night, there's an expectation there that wasn't necessarily there when he was gone. And, um, you know, we have to be, as dads, I know most of us are past the baby stage or the raising children stage, but we have to be deliberate in what we do for our families so that they feel secure. They, there's a security if you're a reliable, honest person that gives comfort and security to not only your family, but the neighbor's family too, because you know who lives next door. Like, like we live in a great neighborhood right now where I moved to. There's a lot of families, young people with children, kids playing in the street, dads playing basketball with their little girls or little boys or, you know, their swing sets. And, and it's really awesome to see. And then when we walk, we see dads and moms riding down the street. You know, the kids have bicycles and we get to talk to them a little bit. And it's, it's awesome. It's God's design. 
and it's in a, and so we have an awesome community um, where even if they don't know the word of God, God has given us the wisdom and he's written the word in a sense. I think in Romans, it talks about we're without excuse because we know in our hearts right from wrong. There's something in life that teaches parents to love their children. If they're taught how to do that, like it, it's just a natural thing to protect them and care for them. And, and so I think God is so awesome. But our culture is blurring the lines of what a dad is and what a mom is, what it means to be a parent. Like they're trying to give that same authority to the school teachers or other forms of leadership that children are under authority that are outside that it really has nothing to do with mom or dad. It has everything to do with it. it's the government. It's somebody, an authority figure that can tell you right from wrong. Your parents don't know everything. And as believers, we have to be deliberately different about how we instruct our children and how we approach them. We have to put the word in their hearts. And the culture is trying to say that the word isn't really that important for living. It's something you can do as part of what you do, but it's not everything. It's not all important. It's just, it's something that you can do. Like, and so I thought about um, Abraham being called the father of believers in Romans chapter 11 and about reading about Abraham's life. And I'll, I got two more verses, I guess, and then I'll stop. But it's in Romans 4.20. I read this verse probably a lot of times, or this book a lot of times. I never really understood what I was reading until I took the class, Power for Abundant Living, and was kind of explained the differences of, well, the differences about the new and the old covenant. I mean, there's there's a lot there. But uh, anyway, it's talking about Abraham and in his life. He's a great person to study about somebody that was an unbeliever. <laughs> that got called by God and um, out of the land of Ur, right? <laughs> and uh, so in verse 20, it says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It says now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, which, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead whom was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification it says therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and I want to go over to Isaiah 26 3 just <coughs> really the verse that I thought of about that that we have peace with God. And most people in life want peace, right? Tranquility. <laughs> it's really a, when we wake up in the morning, if we're not at peace, we're agitated and our whole day is, well, then we do try to clench onto things and hold fast to things we think are important. And we're not going to let anybody take them away from us because it's the only thing I have. But when we, we accept the truth of God's word and we don't stagger at his promises, we can leave our hands open and receive what God has given us. And what it says he gives us through Jesus Christ is peace. Like we have it if we have our hands open and we think on those things. Because right before that, he talks about the God of peace being the umpire of our hearts in Philippians. Right? Be anxious for nothing. And so in uh, Isaiah 26, 3, it says, among other things there, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. And that says, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is Jehovah, his everlasting strength. And, and that's our sure foundation. That God is forever and he's strong and able 
to perform what his word says he will perform, like we just don't give up. And I think that's what makes a real dad a good dad when he just doesn't give up because it gives strength to the family. It gives strength to your children when they think of you, they know you, that you can endure. And if you can endure, they can endure. Yeah. Like you're passing something on that it's, it's written in the heart and not written on pages of paper or tablets of stone. So God is our heavenly father. He's all strong. We can have confidence in him every moment of every day for anything that comes up. And we can rejoice in that because he always has the answers to life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. God bless. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much, John.